you also mentioned about grounding, and I was wondering if you could go into that topic, and I'm sure it'll lead into the symbol grounding problem, which was your PhD dissertation, if I'm not mistaken. Well, <laughs> no, uh, y yes, it was. It was, but uh, it's funny to call it a PhD dissertation. It was, it was already, I did, I, everything was, I didn't do it the way um, people should do it. Everything was done in the wrong order. I should not have been an editor of a journal before I got my PhD. Right? <laughs> but anyway, um, yes, it ended up, I gathered some published articles and that was the PhD dissertation. Um, the, the way that I got to grounding was through categorical perception, which is yet another thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's an effect that happens, a perceptual effect that happens um, when you learn a new category. I mean, everything, let's say, let's just talk visually. I and mean, everything we see, we've seen since we were four years old, since we were, since we could open our eyes and, and, our, and everything went into focus. So the world has looked roughly the same to us since then. But there are subtle changes that uh, that do occur, and um, when you learn a new category, War the Worf hypothesis says that everything that we see is categories that we learn. Well, that's not true. And your other question about innate categories was I answered that. I said no. A lot of them, like colors, a lot of people use colors as an example of a Worf effect, which is. You learn the names of the colors, and then you learn to see them as red, orange, and yellow. And if you're in another language community and you and, and you don't have a dis different word for blue and green, for the category blue and green, uh, bleen, let's say you have bleen, then you wouldn't see the difference between blue and green. Well, that was false. You already have the feature detectors for blue and green. You learn the name of, of a, com a category, which, which is basically blue or green, <laughs> and we call them bleen. Uh, so, OK. So there was an effect there, and it was an effect in language as well. For, for categorical perception originally came from language. Um, phonemes like ba, da, and ga are kind of like red, blue, and green. Um, if you, they're on a continuum, and so is blue, red, uh, red, blue, and green. They're on a continuous uh, variation in, in frequency or in wavelength of, of light. And yet we see these bands that look different. And it's called categorical perception in the case of color. And you have the same thing with, with uh, uh, some sounds, speech sounds, actually. Badaga. You can put them on a continuum, and yet you'll still feel a qualitative difference when you pass from one band into the other. That effect and the, the, the attempt to produce that effect from learning rather than from innate category detectors uh, was what finally indirectly and sort of incoherently led to the symbol grounding problem. Because um, when you learn a hard, this is this we found out experimentally, if you learn a hard category, not an easy one, if it's black and white, you can probably teach black and white to a, to a, to a kid just from a couple of examples, because we already have feature detectors for black and white. But we don't have feature detectors even for it's although it's not, it's still very easy. We don't have as feature detectors for orange or uh, pardon me, uh, tomatoes and apples, red apples. I mean, mm -hmm. red apples and tomatoes are both red round fruit, uh, fruit like things. So we have to learn the features that distinguish apples from tomatoes. With apples, it's easier because they can come in other colors and tomatoes are softer and, and they taste different and all that stuff. So, um, but that's an easy category. I'm not sure whether that would give you the effect that I was interested in. I was interested in learned categorical perception where the, as if the, the, the rainbow starts out as shades of just continuous shades of wash, you don't see red. And then eventually the bands come out once you, once you learn them, red, orange, green, blue. Well, with much more unfamiliar categories, textures, um, Fernanda, whom you remember, Fernanda Perez Gray, yeah, he was able to show that in the beginning there are no categories. It's like the shades of gray. It just, it's a bunch of, of uh, textures that, that vary. They, they, look, they look like 
little black and white bits in uh, like QR uh, codes. Yeah, like QR codes exactly. But if you are trained by supervised reinforcement learning to identify some QR codes as lacamites and some other Q QR codes as calamites, and in fact, you partition the space, so a, we're only talking about dichotomy. So all of the space of QR codes is separated by certain features that we experimenters as gods pick to distinguish the lacamites from the calamites. In the beginning, the, the participants have no idea and some of them, even at the end, have no idea because we only give them an hour of training to learn it. We've gone on since your day to do it for, for weeks and eventually everybody learns it, but some people take it much longer time. And what happens is for those who learn it in an hour, that's enough actually, who we'll learn enough of it in that. We no longer even talk about those who learn it and those who learn, uh, don't learn it. We talk about the degree to which they've learned it, which is mm. simply the percentage that they get right. And during the hour, they get better and better. So they're getting a larger and larger percentage. And at the end of the hour, we test them. We test them before, before they start learning, when it's just a bunch of textures they've never seen and they all look alike. And after, when they've learned what the Lacamites and the Calamites are, to see how well they can tell apart lacamites from calamites. One simple way of doing it, and in your day we did it, was simply give a, either two lacamites, two different lacamites, or two different calamites, or a lacamite and calamite, and ask the subject to rate on a scale how similar they look. That works pretty well, and that already gives the effect. It turns out that before you learn the categories, and after you learn the categories, the differences have changed. The differences between lacamites and calamites, which you rated, so you know, some calamites are more like you know, so some pairs of 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 uh, barcodes or what what did you call them? QR, QR codes. codes. Some 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 uh, some pairs of QR codes are more similar when you don't know anything, and some are more different. So there's variation there. But what happens is those QR codes that are in different categories once you've learned the categories, you know, there's lacamites and calamites. They are rated after having learned the category as as uh, looking more different, and um, within categories, two two lacamites or two calamites, they're not the same, but uh, they're either don't change or they shrink in their in the differences. This effect has also since been found in uh, neural networks. If you give them the same stimuli you give to uh, to human subjects, uh, once they learned it. In their internal representations, I, this is going to be just words, so I'm not going to show you any figures. But the same thing happens. You get you get red, you get blue separating from green. In the beginning, it's all a wash, and then they separate. So that made us think that maybe that's the that's what happens when a category gets grounded. First of all, you learn the features, and the features act like a feature detector that makes the world that, that makes the, the the stimuli look a little different. It's, when when people look at the people who have gone through our experiment with textures, they don't every time they see a texture, they don't suddenly see them as lacamites and calamites. The difference is very subtle, and it, it's only when you restrict them to to QR codes and then you give them a sample, you find that they can tell certain QR codes apart better after they've learned lacamites and calamites. So that's it, and that's the short story. And the idea is that. Um, that's the way symbol grounding works. You have, for, when, when we reduce the dictionary to the minimal grounding set, there's still the question, okay, fine, that's the smallest number of words from which I, I can get to all the rest of them. But how do I get the meanings of those words? And the answer is by direct sensory motor um, uh, uh, um, supervised and unsupervised learning or within eight feature detectors, if you have them already. Right. So. In essence, you're arguing that to experience grounding, not an experience, let's see, that's a weasel word, uh, but to have a grounding, to have grounding, you need to have a body. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because in order to, what we're grounding is names for things outside in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. right? We're not, we're not, we're not chat, we're not la la language, large language models. In fact, we should talk about that GPT because it's will, relevant. Right. Um, we're not that. We're not. We're not a word, word um, um, a pusher. 
uh, like chat GPT. And, and, and moreover, we're not a word pusher with, with a huge uh, feed of words in 2021, chat GPT swallowed huge Everything. chunks of the literature <laughs> the way our brains will never be able to do it. I mean, there's more, there were more words squished in there uh, than, than we'll ever squish into ours. But ours get in there after we we'll remember categorizing is learning what's the right thing to do with the right kind of thing and naming it is just one of the things. And we now know why it's so important because once you've managed to tag them with a name, and you've tagged the features with the name, then in principle, it can all be language words afterwards. But we have to get there. And so the idea is that what we did in the laboratory with lacamites and calamites, and we've done with other kinds of stimuli as well, is what happens uh, in, the, in the real world when the child is learning a language. But before the child learns a language, the child has already learned a whole bunch of categories. And for the ones that it's learned just by trial and error without naming anything, but just doing the right, you don't have to, in the experiment, the response is lacamite or calamite. But on the island, the response is eating it or not eating it, right? So kids are doing a lot of that and they've got the categories, they're ready. If somebody comes to the island and, and, and speaks English and you and you learn um, uh, uh, which ones are which, you can tell them in words that the, the, the edible mushrooms are the black and white striped ones with the red caps and the rest of them are all poisonous, right? Uh, you can tell them that. And then they say, okay, fine. And th those are the edible ones. They can, and they can label it. With, I mean, edible they've already got, but now that they know that those are the edible ones. But for example, with zebras, for example, once you've told them the black and white, you see a bunch of horses and zebras, and you say the black and white ones are called zebras. And then you say, okay, I know what black is. I know what white is. I know what the horse looks like. I know that now that you have to call them zebras. Okay. And so... You also mentioned that the symbol grounding problem is a problem, and can you go into why it's a problem? Uh, well, <laughs> I I more or less did. I said if you're if you're in a that's what the dictionary is meant to tell you. This you can you can you can get all the def definitions, but you still don't understand the meaning of a single word unless you have grounding at least for the minimal grounding set, and that minimal grounding set cannot be grounded by words. That will just, it would continue to be squiggle squaggle dictionary. You have to ground it by finding things in the world to which those words refer and learn mm -hmm. the categories and learning the features that distinguish the members from the, of the category from other categories with other names. See? So that's the symbol grounding problem. How do you do that? And the solution, at least one can't, under determination is relevant here. There are, there may be more solutions, but one solution is what we do in the lab, which is to teach a, a sensory motor body to, uh, to, to, to detect the features that distinguish the lacomites from the calamites. And once it's done that with 1500 uh, categories or the right 1500 categories, it doesn't need to keep doing that in principle anymore. The rest of it can be done with the magic. The really magic thing is language, not chat GPT. And chat GPT is profiting from some of the features of language, right. grounded language. Because for everybody who uses chat GPT, whenever he tells you something you didn't know, unless he uses words you don't know yet, and then you can ask him what those are, and he's like a dictionary too. He is grounding new categories for you verbally, indirectly, the way, the way we do for one another, the way I hope I'm doing to the people who watch this video or listen to this podcast, right? Mm 